Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for this afternoon's webinar. Um, obviously, there's been a lot announced in the last uh, few weeks, so we thought it was worth uh, putting a presentation together to uh, run our clients um, and other businesses through the main changes that have happened um, in the last few weeks. Um, I'm going to be joined by uh, three other panellists uh, this afternoon, so it's not going to be just me that you're listening to. I'd like to say we've got Alison Vickers, who's our managing partner, um, Vanessa thomas Parry, who's our head of people operations, and Gus Williams, who is our chief operating officer. And we are going to be covering different parts of the support that has been announced um, over the recent weeks. Um, we are happy to answer questions, um, both through the webinar and at the end. Um, so if you do have any questions, please, if you have a look at the bottom of your screen or on your, your control panel, you should have a Q uh, and A button. Um, so please type any questions into that as we go along. And we'll, we'll, we'll either try and answer them um, uh, it, by, by typing the answer back in as we go along, or when we get to the question section at the end, we will go through um, and answer them all live. Um, the one other thing to mention is it's quite a long presentation. We've tried to put quite a lot of detail in there today, um, and we may skip through some of it relatively quickly, um, but we will email around all the slides at the end of the presentation, um, and we'll also uh, be taking a recording of this webinar, uh, which we'll put on the website at the end. So if there is anything that you've missed, um, you, can, you can go and check it afterwards. Um, but we're going to kick off um, with Welsh Government grants today. Um, we're then going to go through the job support scheme um, and the, the, the uh, the, the bonus for the furlough scheme, uh, and Alison's going to cover that. Vanessa's then going to talk about, about something new, which is the kickstart scheme, which um, hopefully will be um, useful for a lot of our customers. And then um, th those are the three areas we're going to sort of focus in a bit of detail on. And at the end, then we're going to go through a few more of the either the less um, common uh, uh, thing changes that have come through and some of the things which are actually coming to an end now, things like the bounce back loans where um, the time is, is running out to apply. So we just want to touch on some of the things that have been in place for a while, but there have been some changes. And then just to finish off, there's a couple of other topical issues we want to mention just to make sure everyone's aware as to what is going on. Um, but we're going to start today with the Welsh Government uh, grant support. Um, Ken Stiates, who's the, uh, the, the Minister for Economic Development here in Wales, I got to his feet a couple of weeks ago and announced a further um, 140 million pounds of uh, support for businesses uh, in South, well, in all of Wales, sorry, not just South Wales. Um, it's broken down into two parts. Um, the first part is the, the 60 million pounds, which is going to be given to uh, certain businesses, but only the ones that are impacted by a local lockdown. So that's going to be for retail, leisure, hospitality businesses um, in the 12 to 51,000 rateable value will get £1,500, um, obviously a, a lot less than the, the similar grant that came out at the beginning of the crisis where many of those businesses got £25,000. And then for smaller businesses, you'll get £1,000. And as I understand it, that's going to be coming via the local authorities, um, as did the last one, but there's no details on how to apply for that as yet. So once we know how it works, we will we'll be sending out a mail shot to explain it. But the one I want to focus on today is the second part of that, which is the £80 million which is part of the Economic Resilience Fund Phase 3, um, because that is, I think, where there's probably some work to be done now, um, and you need to start thinking about your, your applications. So um, what we understand about the Economic Resilience Fund Phase 3 is that um, it, it's, it's similar in as much as there's, there's significant amounts of money available for businesses, um, but one of the big changes is you are required to put some of your own money in this time. Um, one of the big changes is the last or the, the phase one and phase two were really about survival, I think is how I would describe it. It was about helping businesses get through um, the incredibly difficult period. But this phase is very different and it's really about the next step. It's about regenerating or improving your business. And so part of that is why I think they're expecting businesses to match some of the, um, some of the investment with their own money. Um, as I say, on the screen there, you've got the different limits and you can look up which ones apply to yourselves. But for smaller businesses, um, you, you, it's possibly 10% you've got to put in. For hospitality businesses, as I understand it, you may still get 100% funding. But as you get up to larger businesses employing more than 250 people, you're probably going to have to put in at least 50% of the investment yourself. Um, and the key um, thing on that slide to notice is the bit at the bottom, which is the date. So it's the week commencing the 26th of October 2020 uh, that applications will open. And our, our, our expectation is this will be a very popular fund. So we, we recommend you to get your applications in as early as you can. Um, the other thing to, to sort of point out is that the timing, the first phase, it actually went live the day before they said it was going to go live. 
Um, but the second phase, it went live, I think about five o'clock on the Monday. So, so certainly we would keep an eye out for it to get your application in early uh, on the 26th uh, when it does go live. Um, in terms of who is eligible, this is another massive change really from funds one and two. Um, and, th and that is that as far as I can see, almost everyone is eligible. So whereas the first two phases, you have to have been hit by the pandemic um, or you, you know, th there were a lot of caveats which discounted people from applying. For this grant, it appears that the majority of businesses in Wales will be able to apply for it. Um, and, and that means that in my view, it's going to be a very fiercely competitive fund because actually, if you think of 80 million pounds between all the businesses in Wales, um, that, that, that's not going to go very far if, if the vast majority apply. So if you want to double check whether you are eligible, the link is on the screen there. Um, but, you know, th th there are very few exclusions unless you have zero employees um, or you're a very small business or you've only started since the 1st of March. Um, th there's really very few businesses that won't be able to, to try and apply to some of this money. Um, so given that and the fact that in reality, I think it's going to be a very competitive pot, you probably need to spend a bit of time thinking about exactly what it is that they're looking for. And there's already a reasonable amount of guidance up there. So I've picked out some of the key areas um, that I think sort of give a good indication as to the things that they want to see in applications to try and make sure that yours is near the top of the pile. What I don't know yet is whether they're going to wait until all the applications are in in that four week period and then start to review them and essentially pick the best the best of the, the batch, or whether they will start reviewing them from days one and two and potentially making awards in the first week. I suspect it could well be the latter, so they will be starting to make awards um, early on in the process. And if that's the case, I think it's really important that you get your, your application in really on that first day or the first couple of days, because we, we know, for example, with the, the first phase of the Economic Resilience Fund, that the money had all gone within a couple of weeks. And though, although in theory it was going to be open for several weeks, the money had gone within a couple of weeks. Um, so, so my strong advice is get your application in early. But in terms of what they're looking for, um, it's, it's clear that they've got, and I, I was on a, a call with a, another um, civil servant from Welsh Government a couple of weeks ago, and nothing to do with this fund, but twice he mentioned these key things, which is supporting young people, which they def define as people under 25, supporting people with disabilities and supporting people from black and minority ethnic communities. So if you are able to put in a, a bid which covers one or all of those areas, I certainly think you are going to have a far stronger chance of, uh, of getting towards the top of the pile. Um, the second thing to point out, we'll talk about the, the sort of the pounds per job, which is, is fairly common with Welsh government. Um, but, but in particular, there's additional funding as we see it if, you, if you're creating new jobs for people under 25. So if you are able to make that part of your project, I think you've got a far, not just a better chance of getting awarded some cash, but also you possibly will get more cash than you would do otherwise. So um, as I say, in terms of what they're looking for, it needs to be a new project or something um, which addresses um, one of the calls to action in the Welsh Government's Economic Action Plan. And so, you know, just so you're aware of what those are, these are the key areas that Welsh Government want to see uh, businesses tackle. So reducing carbon emissions, um, innovation and entrepreneurship, so anything which is going to, you know, you know, projects which are creating new products or services um, are going to score well. Um, things which increase exports, so the Welsh Government is keen to see us export more around the world, so anything which has got an export angle is going to score well. Um, creating high quality employment and skills, so they're keen to, to, to promote um, uh, uh, sort of upskilling of workforce. Um, and I think, you know, when they say high quality employment, what they normally mean by that is, is high paid employment. So improving the skills of their, their workforce. Fair work, I think, generally means um, union representation, so promoting or allowing staff and union representation on boards. That is going to play well for what Welsh Government are looking for. And then developing automation and digitisation. Um, so certainly if you're a retail business and you want to set up a website or improve your online presence, those are the sort of projects that they are, are looking to develop. And just, just some other points then which have picked up, and you know, many of them mirror what I've just said, but, but they've, they've also got quite a useful example projects. Um, so they, they talk about the types of costs that they're willing to support. So paying wages costs um, for the future development of the business is going to be fine. Investing in digital capability, investing in new processes and systems. Um, they, 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 and, and certainly in the skills part there, the bit which is a little bit unclear to me is they, they talk here about investing in equipment and also about improvements to facilities as being potentially fundable. 
but it makes it very clear that they will only fund revenue expenditure, which I think comes down to a Welsh government issue as to which pot of money this is coming out of. But it means that, you know, you probably need to speak to your accountant because if you're putting a bid in with a lot of equipment in there and that's going to end up being capitalised, it may not be eligible. But a key point to realise is you can use the, the, the capital investment as what they call your match. So if you've put a project together for, for £20,000 and some of that is going to be uh, an investment in, let's say, a new server for um, to, to, to host your new website or whatever, um, or to improve the, uh, the, the digital capability of your business, although that might be capitalised in the accounts, you can use that as your match. So if you spend £2,000 in your server, you can hopefully then claim £18,000 through the grant um, to fund the staff costs and the other, the other parts of your project. So as I said, there are some examples on their, their website. So as you click through the eligibility checker, you will get this link to, um, to a point which gives some examples. And once again, there's some nice little hints as to the sort of thing that they're looking for in there. So there's this value for money award, which um, is always the way the Welsh government works, is I think they base it on two and a half thousand pounds per job. So if you've got 20, uh, 20 people working in your business or 20 people who are going to be part of that project, um, it looks like you can then apply for up to 50,000, which would work out to two and a half thousand pounds per job. But what this means is if you've only get, say, got 15 people in your business, you, you know, it's not, I don't think it's worth applying for 50,000 because I suspect if you've only got 15 people in your business, you're going to be capped um, at 37 and a half thousand pounds um, for, for what you can apply. Um, but it's worth noting, as I say, one of the examples, they talk about an additional thousand pound a job if you're creating a new job for somebody who's under 25. So bear that in mind um, and, 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 and just make sure you get your intervention rate. So as your staff numbers go up, you can claim less back um, as grant from the government and you have to put more in. So just make sure you get those points of detail correct. Um, but at this point, I think the important thing is to think like a politician. So, you know, you may want to talk about what a wonderful job, uh, what a wonderful project it is and how it's going to help your business. But you need to think about from the politicians point of view, they like to talk about how many jobs they've managed to create as part of this scheme or how many jobs they managed to safeguard. Um, and I've certainly heard Ken Skates on a number of times mention that 100,000 jobs are safeguarded from the first phase. So make sure you get those key phrases in there. How many jobs are you creating? How many are ring fenced uh, for under 25s or people who are disabled? How many jobs have you safeguarded? Touch those key points about exporting, reducing carbon emissions, all of those things are really important to get into the front and centre of your, your project application. Um, just very quickly then, a few things you can't do with it. So you can't fund your day-to-day -day overheads unless it's directly associated with the project. You can't use the money to pay off debt. Um, you can't use it for redundancy and you can't use it for purchases um, that were made before the application process started. Um, a quick mention as well of the economic contract. So if you sign up for, uh, for the funds, the Welsh Government will expect you to sign up for the economic contract. There's nothing in there I don't think that is, is hugely problematic to most businesses, but just be aware of that key phase in there, which is this is the first stage requirement for businesses, um, and, and there, will be, there will be changes in the future. So, um, it, you know, you are signing a little bit of an open-ended contract by accepting this money. Um, so just be aware of that risk when you when you say yes and, and accept it. So just finally, then on this part, I just wanted to mention what you need to get ready now. So when you go through the process, if you're eligible, this is what you need, what is on the screen in front of you now. Most of it will be information you've got to hand um, in your business. It won't take you long to find, but it's the three or four things at the bottom of that list that you need to really start thinking about. So put some thought and effort into the plan development, into the description of the project. So it's gonna be competitive. Um, you need to put a really good uh, proposal together. If you need quotes, you need to start getting them now. So as I say, you've got them in ready for the 26th of October. Um, there needs to be a high level plan to deliver the development. And that really needs to link back then to your, your sustainable business plan. So if you haven't got a, sort of an outline business plan in place, you need to start putting something together um, so if they do ask to see it, um, you, you, you can provide it along with a high level plan of what the project is. So, you know, as I say, there's a number of things there which you can be starting work on this week and next week to make sure that you're ready to get your, your application in as soon after the deadline um, or as soon as after the applications go live uh, on the 26th of October. So that's, I think, pretty much everything we know at the moment about the third phase of the Economics and Resilience Fund. I hope that's been helpful and, and got you thinking about the sort of projects that you can put together. Um, but I'm now going to hand over to Alison, uh, who's going to talk us through 
um, the next set of changes, which is the job support scheme and the job retention bonus. Uh, thanks very much, Harry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. So I'll touch on the job support scheme, how it's been extended and the job retention bonus. So moving on to the next slide. I think Harry's in charge of the slides there. So, uh, so first of all, if we look at the job support scheme, it opens from the 1st of November coming up. The data, the information was last updated on the 24th of September. Can I just say, and I may mention this a couple of times, the devil is in the detail. So we're awaiting, they put the headlines out there and then we await the details. So we'll watch this space and keep you informed. The scheme runs for six months and it ends the 30th of April, 2021. And it is aimed, and, and I stress the word there, aimed to allow employees to earn at least 77% of their normal pay. And I'll come on to some calculations shortly. So if we look at a fact sheet first. So what is, what is it? So it's des designed to protect viable jobs. So again, let's look at that word viable. They have to be that they, they're considered permanent viable jobs for the long term of the business. It's meant for businesses facing low demand. The government are looking to pay one third of the hours not worked up to a cap. And again, I'll take you through the cap with the employer paying a further one third of the hours not worked. Then the employers will also pay, obviously, the hours that are worked. Employers using the job support scheme will be able to claim the job retention bonus. So it doesn't void you from claiming that bonus as long as you meet that um, criteria. So who is eligible? All employers with UK bank accounts and UK pays you earn schemes. Neither the employer nor the employee needed to have um, claimed under the coronavirus job retention scheme. So you can be new to the claiming. A um, couple of things to be careful from. If you're a small and medium size enterprise, there's no financial financial assessment. It's an automatic entitlement. Any large enterprises, you will need to meet a financial assessment. If we move on to the next. Um, so for employees, so this is something that we did see in the last, um, uh, under the furlough scheme, as I like to call it, there were people who fell out of the equation and this can happen here as well. So the employees must be on the employer's payroll system as of the 23rd of September, 2020. And the RTI, the real-time information submission must have been made by this date. So if you've started your um, new job in the first of September and you get paid by the end of the month. So if you've not had a paycheck yet, you will fall out of this scheme. So you needed to have been submitted under RTI by the 23rd of September. What the government have announced at the initial three months phase through to January, where they guarantee they'll pay their third, but the employees must work a minimum of third of their usual hours. Um, we await that second phase. What the government, and in the government's own words, you can cycle on and off the scheme. You can dip in and dip out. However, there must be a minimum of a seven-day period. They're also allowing um, shift work. There's a shift pattern. So again, you must see these arrangements over a seven-day period. We move on, Harry. So, what does the grant cover? So, the grant, uh, the government and the employer, as I say, must cover the third of the hours not worked. Um, the government's contribution is capped, so just have a little bit of care there for any higher rate employees. So, it's capped at six hundred and ninety-seven pounds and ninety-two pence a support a month, which is equates to a three thousand one hundred and twenty-five pound gross salary or seven hundred and twenty-one weekly salary. It is paid in arrear, so you need to have the cash flow there to start. What it doesn't cover is employers, national insurance, class one national insurance and, and employers pension. As the employer, you have to pick this up. The pay will be based on the usual wage. So the calculation will be similar to the job coronavirus job retention scheme. So again, we will await the detailed guidance. Um, and as an employer, you must pay for the contracted hours worked. I put this in red, this next part. The initial guidance suggests that the expectation, so I've put that in inverted commas, is that you don't top up the employee's wages. But I've also seen some headlines out there saying you can. So when I go to the government web um, information uh, release, it says that's the expectation. So again, we await this, um, we await, we watch that space. 
So what does it mean for the employees? So as I say, you must work at least one third of your usual hours. Um, you'll get normal pay for that. You will get two thirds of your usual pay for the hours not worked. And this is a couple of key points now. You cannot be made redundant or put on notice during this period. It's there to secure viable jobs. And um, members of staff who started a new job before the deadline, as I say, who are yet to receive their paycheck will be excluded. So take care of those new members of staff. Uh, what I've done is I can't, it can't be an accountant's talk without some figures. So I'll just take you through the headline. So what the, I've done person A and person B. You've got two members of staff. I've shown them only working one third of the hours. So someone, a higher rate payer to start and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and um, someone towards minimum wages, my person number two. So the person A will normally expect to earn £777 a week. And um, working a third of the hours, they will now receive £592.73. The government's aim was to get to 77%. You can see they've slightly fallen short because the cap has kicked in. You can see the hours worked there, the government will only pay the 161.06 per week. That's the cap. This is These are weekly rates. Person B, who's on a lower wage, more of a part-time person, they'll work their 10 hours, minimum of a third, and they will get their 77%, 77.77. They will get 221 of their usual 285 pay that they've previously enjoyed. So what does it really cost the employer? So on the next slide, what I've set out here. So your usual cost when you've had person A has been £880 a week, just over. Person B has cost you just under £306 a week. Under the new job support scheme, they will still cost you, person A is still going to cost you £504 a week. So whilst we've got a saving, it's not a huge saving, um, person B, you'll get a little bit more of a saving. It'll cost you £168. So you'll see the government contribution there is relatively low at 24% for person A and 27% for person B. So just to sort of flag that up, there is a cost that you're going to have to commit to. And bear in mind, you're going to be paying this in arrears as well. So when you're planning how the staff and how you're going to, to staff your business, um, just take those percentages into account. So claiming it's done in arrears after the RTI has been submitted. You can claim it monthly. It will open in December, so you'll have paid your November's pay and then you claim it. And it is subject to HMRC checks, so they will be checking. What, um, what we've got also, uh, this was announced last Friday, so hot off the press, is the Coronavirus Job Support Scheme expanded, so the new furlough scheme, I think, as the press is calling it. This is a little bit more generous from the government, but there are tighter rules sort of applying. So um, again, we await the detail and, and that's where the important information is held. It applies from the 1st of um, November onwards. And this is where the government will pay two thirds of the wages and the employer will pay nil of the gross wages. As I say, it's, it's, so it's currently more generous than the final month of the coronavirus job retention scheme, which is where the government are paying 60%. Um, there's no need for any minimum hours worked, and it, but it will only apply to employees where the venue, where the business has been ordered to shut down completely. Um, now what the initial uh, legislation is saying, or the initial headlines, you, they must have closed by the 1st of November 2020 to qualify. I suppose watch this space as more local areas go into lockdown, but that was the, the headline. The claim is capped at £2,100 a month. As employers, you still have to meet the employer's national, national insurance and the employer's pension. So just be mindful there is a cost. And the employee needs to be off for a minimum of seven days before they can qualify to, um, to be able to claim. And, this, and in this instance, the employers can top up the wages. So previously the suggestion it wasn't with this one, uh, it is. So um, moving on to the job retention bonus. So this is coming up, it's a thousand pound um, eligible for every eligible employee. They must have furloughed, um, must have been furloughed under the original um, job retention scheme. Uh, the, the claim still applies if the employees are in the, uh, are still on the new job support scheme. So as I've already mentioned, if you've moved on to the job support scheme, it doesn't void you from receiving this bonus. 
uh, all employees, uh, if you've repaid any of the, the money, so if you felt it wasn't appropriate to claim and decided that they would come into employment, this, they cannot claim a bonus, so that, that becomes void. The members of staff must have been continuously employed from the period to the from the job retention um, scheme through to the 31st of January 2021. And as at that date, you cannot be under notice. So they need to be an ongoing employment as at the 31st of January. You must meet the minimum retention uh, minimum threshold, income threshold, and I'll come on to that. And if you have taken acquired a new business or acquired staff and TUP, they will still be eligible. So that doesn't void them. Where office ho holders and agency workers qualified for the CJRS, they will still qualify for the bonus on the basis they meet the minimum income. Um, and the bonus, the good news for employers is that the bonus doesn't have to be paid to employees. It can be retained within the business. So let's look at that minimum income threshold. So um, the employees must have earned a minimum of £1,560 gross over the three months in question to so the 5th of April 21, must be taxable payment earnings, and there must be one taxable payment per month. Um, it could be a minimum of one, so you can have weekly, but it must be a minimum of one. The threshold uh, applies regardless of any deductions to the employee pay. So if there's statutory or unpaid leave, um, you still need to meet that £1,560 gross and it has to be gross taxable earnings. So the claims open on the 15th of February and we're expecting updated guidance by the end of January. So watch this space and we'll certainly be letting, um, letting you know that updated guidance. Agents can claim on your behalf. Um, the, the bonus will arrive, uh, will be included in arriving at your taxable profits, so it will affect um, the corporation tax or income tax you pay, and you must claim it by the 31st of March, so the, the government have created a window in which you must claim the amount. Before claiming, and I've, I've, um, I've lifted this from the government website, so please, you know, if double check this because this could void any claims. So before claiming, make sure all your submissions are up to date. Um, you've told the revenue about any levers, um, leaving dates, etc. If if you use irregular payment patterns, use the HMRC's irregular payment pattern indicator in the RTI form. So again, make sure that those employees who are not paid regularly, um, we capture those correctly. Make sure you provide any employee data from past claims that the HMRC have requested. So if you've failed to answer those, that may void your claim. So make sure you're up to date. And make sure that all the claims have been accurately submitted. I think if the revenue find there's inaccurate claims, whether there's too little um, or, or too much, that could again void that bonus. So it's important that you get those four areas covered off. Um, I think that's now, so I'm going to hand over now to Vanessa, who will take you through the, the next part. Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, thanks, Alison. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to take give you through uh, an overview of the Kickstart scheme. Uh, I, I'm going to start by saying it's a moving target. Uh, we don't know everything yet. Uh, the learning providers, colleges and local authorities acting as gateway providers still don't know everything. And, they, and they're pushing a lot of questions back to DWP about it. But uh, we'll go through what we know so far. So if I start um, by talking about what it is. It is a government funded scheme. And I think if anybody out there has used any of these type of schemes before, whether that be some European, European social funding or skills for industry funding, you know these things are rarely as simple as they seem on the surface. And there's usually a lot more detail required to access that type of funding. Just to say this funding is coming straight from DWP um, and it highly involves uh, Job Centre Plus as well. So. At the moment, it's very much prioritised to a particular group of people, and that's the 16 to 24 year olds who are currently claiming universal credit. This is who they're going to initially prioritise. There's some uh, sort of speculation that when this original sort of version of it comes to an end next December, uh, that they will broaden that group and, and still be probably 16 to 24, but not necessarily on a universal credit. The young people involved will be employed directly by the employer. So it's really important that you all take us into consideration when you're thinking about your employment contracts and what you'll be offering people. You will be offering them a fixed term employment. So consider that when you are recruiting people through the scheme. 
what you're going to have is a pool of people provided to you by Job Centre Plus. So that's also worth noting here. You will have a mixture of candidates. They will. It's not a recruitment scheme where you will recruit yourself directly. You will be provided with a pool of candidates from Job Centre Plus. This could mean a mixture of people from school leavers to graduates, people with some experience or no experience. So it, it will really be a mixture pool where Job Centre Plus have kind of directed that as well. So how it will be funded and what happens at the end of it? Well, it's funded for 25 hours a week. So there's nothing to stop employers paying over national minimum wage or for more hours. You can employ somebody full time if you want to, but the funding will be capped at 25 hours a week, plus the associated on costs for the national minimum wage for that person. Uh, there is also a, a 1500 pound job placement um, fund for setup costs and training associated with the placement. We'll discuss that a little bit more a bit later as well, but just to say that's maybe not the kind of gold chest that it, it first appears to be. Once the job placement is created, it lasts for six months. So it's a fixed term placement and that then will come to an end and that another person can fit into that slot so that it can be a cyclical placement. The good news is that everybody can access the scheme. So all employers of all sizes, but there, again, with like many of these funding opportunities, there are quite a rigid criteria about accessing the funding. So while everyone can access it, you do have to make sure that those jobs are new jobs. They must not replace existing or planned vacancies, and they must not cause existing employees to have access to less work. So it's important you put a bit of thought into what those roles are going to be. It must be for 25 hours per week. So you will be bidding for funding for a role that is at least 25 hours a week, and it must be for the six months. Like I said, it must be national minimum wage for their age group. And what they're looking for is jobs that people can come in and hit the ground running. So they don't want people to have to undertake extensive training. They want something where people can start their placement and start learning real employability and you know, workplace skills quite well, pretty much straight off the bat. So it's really important that it doesn't require a lot of extensive training. Thank you, Harry. So um, when we talk about applications, because we are applying for funding here for a role that even though you're going to be the employer, you're applying for funding for it. Again, like with the other schemes that, that Harry talked about as well, put a bit of thought into your application. They're looking for specific things. What they're looking for is people who access the scheme to come out of it at the end of their six months more employable. So they've had access to lots of things. So are you going to be able to support them to look for longer term work after the placement? Are you, are you going to teach them skills they might need to do that? Um, can you support them with CV you know, generation and interview preparations? Uh, and also about some key skills that, that employers look for when that person moves on so that they can demonstrate those in potentially a longer than term placement somewhere else or onto another scheme. So things like teamwork, attendance, timekeeping, and, and really just making sure that there's a quality placement and not just sort of, it's an extra pair of hands. It needs to be a quality placement. You can include, though they haven't made it widely known, but gateway providers have told me that you can include posts that you're not necessarily ready to offer now. So when you put your application in, they, the start dates can be between now, sort of between now and when the scheme is planned to close in December 2021. So do have a look at your workforce planning. Think about what your, your might, business might look like in six months' time. So it doesn't have to be about right now. It could be posts you're planning on. Be prepared to provide some, some detail in your application. They are going to ask you for a bit more meat on the bone than just, I've got a vacancy, so it's worth considering that. So when we talk about access in the scheme, probably to understand how, it, how it's going to look is important. So applications from employers will be submitted to DWP. Now, they'll be submitted in, in two different ways. One, either directly, because you're in a position where you might be able to offer 30 plus placements, or through what we're calling a gateway provider. What When the guidance initially came out, they were referred to as intermediaries. And the gateway provider is going to try and get employers in the local area to put together lots of 30. So they're going to encourage applications from multiple employers to really provide 30 placements before they can put their application into DWP. 
So I would really strongly advise engaging with your local gateway providers. There are links in the presentation where you can find a list of these in your local area. They are likely to be your local authority, chambers of commerce, local colleges, or specialist um, career advisory services. So I would link in with them as soon as possible because they are waiting to get to the magic 30 before they put applications in. Once the application's gone into DWP, it will go through an approval process. The approval process will then send, if it's approved, will go to Job Centre Plus, and that's where that pool of candidates will be put together by Job Centre Plus. A couple of points of interest then that, and not all of them are kind of in the guidance, some of them are coming back via feedback from gateways, is that funding for salary will be pay, paid monthly in arrears is what the guidance is saying. Feedback from uh, gateway providers is saying that there could be a delay in that. And so obviously you're going to be front funding those, that salary payment. The £1,500 should be paid at the beginning of the placement, but I would just be cautious of that because there is going to be some negotiation over that, particularly if you're using a gateway provider or you've, in, you've enlisted somebody's help in providing some of the employability skills services. So if you've decided that you're going to work with someone else to provide that placement with the the CV preparation and interview skill preparation, then they are going to want a share of your £1,500. And just a point as well, if you are using a gateway provider, all that funding is going to go through your gateway provider first. So they are then going to pass it on to you. So again, this is where delays might be built into accessing new funding and also up for negotiation about the split of that £1,500 is going to look like between you and the gateway provider. Okay. Uh, Job Centre Plus, like I said, will be responsible for selecting a pool of candidates to put forward. You must use this process if you want to access the funding. Uh, you cannot access the funding if you use any other form of recruitment. It must go through this process. Um, there's certainly a lot of uncertainty with the gateway providers. They still got lots of questions. They're pushing back to DWP um, and asking of um, us as well as employers, they, they kind of trying to get feedback from people. And also to bear in mind, applications can take a month for approval. So at the moment, the scheme is said to run to December 2021. So I would really advise you get your applications in early um, to may really make the most of it. So possibly even fitting in two placements um, and multiple roles. So you could have you know anywhere between, well, 30 upwards or 30 below, depending on which option you're going with. There are some promotional materials around. We do suspect guidance to change, um, but it's, it, has, it has all the becomings of a really good scheme for getting people back into work and also providing employers with some, some additional support in from an from employment point of view. But it, is, it does come with the need to provide high quality placements. It is not just a recruitment scheme. So some thought will need to be put into it. So that's all I'm going to say on that. Hopefully, if you've got any Q&As, please put them into the, the question and answer box and we'll try and get to them later. Uh, I'm now going to pass back to Alison, who's going to cover stamp duty and hospitality VAT. Oh, hi, everybody oh, hi. again. Thanks very much, Vanessa. That was, uh, that was really good, very informative. So I'll cover the stamp duty and hospitality VAT. So um, Wales has its own stamp duty. So that power was devolved to Wales and it's the land transaction tax. And um, I've got on the next slide, Harry, if you could um, just take. So what we've got, so on the 27th of July, the Welsh Government announced that home buyers in Wales uh, will have a, a sort of a reduced land transaction tax. So historically, if um, you bought a house up to 180,000, it was exempt from um, the, this land transaction tax tax. They've moved that limit now to 250,000. So I've set out the bans there. It's in place till the end of March 2021. They've done it to really stimulate um, property demand. And I think it has had, the, you know, we've seen a benefit of that. So you can see for the 250, then up to 400, it's 5%. Uh, the 750 is 7.5% and so on. So you buy a property for 750,000, you'll pay the first tranche at nil, the next tranche at five, and that, that final part at that 7.5%. Just a little bit of sort of a little bit of warning, second homes and buy to lets, they have got this additional 3% uh, rate. And what Wales have done differently in England, so what England did was to move the second home bans in line with the, with the um, 
the, the additional cut support they give on the initial uh, banding, if you like, so the nil and 5%. Uh, Wales have not done that. So we've got this extra band existing. So the 0 to 180%, we've got the 3%. The 180 to 250K of property value, which under the old, uh, the, the permanent rules, if you like, was at 3.5%. Now that's up to 6.5%. The rest of the band in them follows the temporary measures put in place with that 3% uplift. So don't forget about that, that additional 3% for the second home. There, there's no benefit there. If we look at hospitality VAT, so the rate for VAT for hospitality has been reduced from the 20% standard to 5%. So where standard rate applied, you now apply a 5%. It was initially set to the 12th of uh, January 2021. This has now been extended to the 31st of March. I think that just gives you an indication of what the government of the government's nervousness in the new year. Uh, the reduced rate applies to hospitality, so I'll take you a little bit more in, uh, through the detail later, but it'll cover food and non-alcoholic drinks and to eat on the premises or take away. It'll cover hotels and holiday accommodation, so whether it's hotels and similar um, supplies of different type of accommodations, caravans, tents, etc. It also covers admission to certain attractions. So I've listed a few there. There are many more shows, cinemas, theatres. It'll also cover live online performances. So just a little bit of care there. If they're recorded and there's a, there's a pay to view, the recorded one does not enjoy this 5% reduction. It's the live ones that enjoy, enjoy the benefit. Again, just to, to, to be mindful, for those of you who are on a flat rate VAT scheme, you will benefit from a reduced percentage. And I know some uh, VAT payers out there, uh, they, they are... Um, they're on a, a, an agreed methodology with the revenue. They they um, come up with their own scheme, a VAT scheme, and again, that needs to be flexed to incorporate that lower five percent. So, if we look at um, so really what's meant by hospitality. So, just to summarise this in a little bit more detail, so it's hot and cold foods consumed on the premises, hot and cold non-alcoholic beverages again consumed on the premises, hot takeaway food supply. But the care here is it's only on hot takeaway non-alcoholic beverages. They buy a bottle of water, I might do that, they say buy a bottle of Diet Coke or something, which um, I'll often buy, that is still subject to the 20% VAT. So it's only hot um, for non-alcoholic beverages, apply the 5%. A little bit of care where you, you put, supply catering services for consumption of premises, that standard rate, that 20%, will apply so you don't get the benefit of the reduced rates there. So who really will benefit from this reduced fat? It could be a mixture. So the businesses, by keeping the prices at the same rate, you will get to retain more of your sales income. The customer, you can pass on the VAT and reduce prices if you wish, or a mixture of both, so a blend. So I've just done an example again. Um, if someone comes and eats at your restaurant, your cafe, uh, all non-alcoholic drinks, just to stress that part. And historically, it would have been £29.50 VAT inclusive. The VAT on that was £4.92. So as a business, you retain £24.58 to sales. If you decide to keep the £29.50 as the same selling price, you now hand over £1.40 to HMRC, to Mr. Customs and Excise, or Miss Customs and Excise, I could say. So you, you're actually saving £3.52. Uh, alternatively, you could apply the 5% VAT to the £24.58, which is your new sales figure, and you charge the customer £25.81. The customer can save £3.69, or you can do a blend of both. Um, it's, it's your call, really, it's, um, as you can see some example figures there, and, and you can decide what's best for your business and to attract the customers. So that was a quick walkthrough for, for the, um, the benefits of the, the VAT. So I'm handing back now to Harry to take you through the next part of, the, of our uh, webinar. Thanks, Harry. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, so yeah, I just want to sort of touch on a few quick things. Nothing here is particularly new because all of these different uh, forms of support were actually announced back at the beginning of the crisis, but all have had little changes in the last month. So uh, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, uh, made a number of changes uh, about a month ago. So I just wanted to update everyone on those in case you missed them. Um, the first one is bounce back loans. Now, I mean, bounce back loans, I think have been an incredible success. 
Um, depending on how you look at it, I think I think I'm right in saying they're expecting at least 1.3 million businesses to take out a bounce back loan, and the total borrowing is I think north already of 40 billion pounds. So you know they, they, there's been a huge success in getting money out to the front line to businesses who are struggling. Um, so but but just be aware that the deadline now is coming up. So it was originally the beginning of November, but if you haven't applied for one of these loans and you want one, you've only now got till the 30th of November 2020 to apply for them. Um, the, the, the principle is you can borrow up to 25% of your turnover, up to a maximum of 50,000, um, no interest for the first year. Well, there is interest, but the government pays it for you, but no repayments. Uh, they're unsecured loans, so you haven't got to give any security. Um, and, and the long-term interest is only 2.5% as well, so pretty cheap um, all in all. Um, and the big change or, or, or you know, relatively important change which happened was that the repayment terms were pushed out from uh, over a five year period after the first year interest free. You've now effectively got, I think, nine years so a total 10 year uh, window to repay the loan, which means those loan repayments are probably going to be more like half what you were expecting before. So potentially, if, if that is a benefit and, and it was the loan repayments that were putting you off before, it may be worth something you're looking at now. Or if it's just because you know you had enough money to get through the first lockdown, but the second one is causing more problems, um, bounce back loans, as I say, are, are something that are worth looking at. Um, the next thing I wanted to touch on was tax deferral. So many people um, took, uh, took advantage of uh, the, the offer to essentially not pay your personal tax bill last July in July 2020, um, and instead to pay it in January along with your your payment on account and your balancing payment. So you were, you, were, you were saving up a very big bill potentially for the end of January um, 2021. And obviously the fact that we're now back into a second lockdown, um, I think they, they realized that this is gonna cause an awful lot of taxpayers an awful lot of problems. Um, and so they've essentially increased the level at which they're happy to, or, or relatively relaxed about extending those payment terms. So whereas payments up to 10,000 pounds for personal tax are relatively easy to spread, They've now upped that to 30,000 um, £30, pounds. So you've now got the opportunity to, to spread those payments um, over a slightly longer period. Um, the, the point to be aware on that though is that there are a number of conditions. So you have to be up to date with your taxes. So you have to have all your tax returns in. You can't have any other debts with HMRC in order to set up a plan. The tax owing needs to be between 32 pounds and I've no idea where they get that number from, but 32 pounds and 30,000. And you have to get the payment plan agreed within 60 days. So in reality, you've got to have it agreed by the end of March. It's no good waiting until the middle of summer and then, and then trying to get a payment plan set up. In reality, I'd recommend doing it at the end of January uh, in advance, essentially, to tell them if we can't pay, can we spread it out? Um, pro probably the, the thing to be aware of, though, is that this isn't free money. They will be charging you interest. Um, so, so if you haven't paid whatever you owe by the 1st of February, you will be charged interest um, on, on the period after that. So bear that in mind. And if you, if you do end up with a bill over £30,000, it's not a case of there's no way that they're going to spread it. Um, or if it's a case of you can't pay it off even over 12 months, you need more time to pay. Um, the phone number is there on the screen. Give them a ring and, and, and see what you can negotiate. And just a quick reminder, there's not been an extension. You, you're probably aware many companies have been given an extension to file there. Um, their accounts. As things stand today, I don't believe there's any extension for tax returns. You still got to get them in by the 31st of January 2021. Um, and the other thing that was changed then was the VAT deferral. So um, again, many businesses decided not to, or were to give in and took the option not to pay their VAT bill um, for sort of March, um, the March, April, May bill that would have fallen due in the early part of 2020. And that money has got to be paid in March 2021. But again, they've given the option now, rather than pay that in one big lump uh, at the end of March, you can now pay that in 11 uh, payments across the, the, the 11 months of next year or going into 2022. Um, and, the, and the nice thing about that one is, as I understand it, that one is interest free. So it's effectively another low cost loan from the government um, to help you, you, you get your business through the next, uh, the next couple of years. So as I say, just a few quick points there that you may have missed in uh, all the other announcements. Uh, which I hope some may, some of them may be of use. But at that point, I'll hand over to uh, to Gus Williams, who's our operations manager, who's going to talk about the the COVID nineteen future fund. Yeah, thanks, Harry. Uh, the UK future fund is is more limited in its appeal and scope than the other schemes that we've talked about today. However, in certain circumstances, it is a a generous alternative to to, to other funding. This is really aimed at startups and those companies which are pre revenue um, or pre pre profit. 
you know, and it really fills the gaps between for those companies which are not eligible for C bills or for whom other forms of bank lending are have onerous terms. And you know, an example would be, you know, if you've got your alternative is onerous bank lending with personal guarantees as an investor, then this is potentially a, a generous alternative. Or if you're a startup that that is already planning to look for additional investment or needs that additional investment to tide the business over until you know until, until the economy recovers um so it covers it, it it's open to for loans to, to from 125,000 to 5 million um and and it's open for applications it's been extended it had originally closed at september it's now closing at the end of november um business is eligible if it's uk incorporated um some of the key things it has to your, the, the startup has to have raised at least 250,000 in, in equity investment from third party investors in the last five years. Um, obviously it can't be a traded company on any regulated market or exchange. It needs to have been incorporated by the end of last year. Um, and, and one of the additional um, sort of requirements is that it needs to have either half or more of it, its employees UK based or half of more revenues from UK sales. That was brought in to change the requirement that, that um, this is around parent companies. So if it's if it's got a parent company that's receiving funding um, from investors, it potentially the business is now in scope as well. Uh, Harry, if we can go to the next slide. So some of the key terms, the, the important ones are this is investor-led process. So it's the investor who makes the uh, initial uh, application. Um, the 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 it, the company will then review any financial statements and confirm the information supplied by the investor is true. It's a match funding scheme. Um, so the, the future fund will match 100% of the amount um, provided by the investors up to that maximum of 5 million. So you do need to have that matched funding by other investors in place to, to access this money. Um, just the, the use of proceeds, it can't it essentially can't be paid out of the, the firm to repay borrowings, dividends, or pay any bonuses or other advisory for, fees and particularly to, to, to any linked parties. Um, the key terms are ne negotiable, minimum 8% um, non-compounding interest, which is not repayable. It, it, it's repayable at the end of the loan or on conversion. Um, typically, the loans will mature after 36 months and, and convert in certain circumstances. Conversion rates and some of those other things are, are, um, are subject to some, some negotiation. If you move on to the next slide, so here. Uh, one of the key requirements is around in eligible investors. So all of the investors in the startup must be eligible under the terms um, laid out here. And really the, the, the key to this is the government doesn't want to be supporting individuals who go and cash in their pensions and put all their money into a single startup. So you need to qualify under the various FCA um, guidelines and regulations around what, what a qualifying investor is. However, most individuals investing in startups will qualify under one of those under one of those terms. So I say it's fairly limited in its scope and application, but it is worth looking up if you have got a, a, a startup that is, is pre-profit or pre um, pre-revenue and are requiring additional funding. As I say, there are, are circumstances in which this alternative is quite quite a generous option for some startup companies. Um, that's it. I think I'll hand back to Harry now to sort of to, um, to round up. Thank you, Gus. Um, as uh, you know, just before we, we finish, um, we're coming to the end of today's webinar. So thank you very much. But if anyone's got any questions they want us to answer sort of live, uh, please spend uh, the next minute or so uh, typing them in and we'll try and deal with them now. But of course, you're more than welcome to, to send uh, an email. Um, or give us a ring, your regular contact, and we can then run through uh, run through any specific questions to your business uh, or clarify any points uh, from today's webinar. Um, the one thing I just wanted to, to touch on to finalise is our tax investigation service. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, they've already handed out £40 billion in bounce back loans, and I think they're expecting about £25 billion of that money to um, not come back in. Um, and on top of that, but you know, that, that's actually a drop in the ocean. That they, they believe that they project project at the moment um, that 320 billion will be spent uh, on this crisis. And I think that was before some of the things that Alison mentioned earlier, which have only been announced in the last week. So, you know, we, we expect at some point um, there's going to have to be a fairly major change in either tax increases or public sector cuts. 
But I think in reality, we don't expect to see any of that happening in the next uh, few years, um, because, uh, you know, I think both would be fairly unpalatable given the state of the economy and given the, uh, you know, you know what, what, what the public sector has done to support um, us, us, us as a country in the last few months. But, but one of the, the areas where they probably can target people fairly easily without causing the bad press is to increase tax investigations. Um, and, and if you factor in as well the fact that the furlough scheme, self-employment grant scheme, all of these different types of support have, have massively increased the complexity of what is going on at the moment. Um, we think this is an area that the revenue are really going to target in the next year or so. So if you're not already um, part of our tax investigation service, if you don't pay us a, a a regular standing order to, to ensure that you're covered. So if, if you did have an inspection, all of our fees dealing with it would be covered. Um, it's something we strongly recommend you consider subscribing to at the moment. Um, what we know because we, we, we underwrite the service with a, another insurer, we know those costs are, are likely to go up because of all the, uh, the expected increase in, in inspections. So if you want to join, um, now is probably the time to sign up before those, those price rises come in. And if you'd like to know more about it, then Lewis's email uh, is on the screen there. So contact Lewis by email or give us a ring and we'd be happy to give you more details about the, 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 the screen. So um, with that, I think that's everything we wanted to cover off today. Um, so if anyone has got any questions, we're, we're more than happy to, uh, to deal with them. I think uh, there's one that's come in. So Alison, do you want to pick that one up? Yes, just um, someone's asked, could the, the presentations, could the slides be emailed out? So yes, we'll make sure they're, um, they're emailed out. And thank you very much for saying you've enjoyed the presentation. That's fantastic. And if in doubt, you know, the, the, the slides are there, some calculations are there, some more details are there. But if in doubt, contact us. You know, I touched on the VAT, it's far reaching. It can be some complex areas. If in doubt, just ask the question, you know, that we're here to help. Um, but uh, by all means, uh, everybody will make sure everybody has a copy of the slides. Harry, there's another question. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, there we are. I'll leave that another to question you. has come through about the, uh, the, 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 the economic resilience phase three. There, there is supposed to be some specific money or right for hospitality companies as well, but we don't have a great deal of detail on that as yet. But as I say, as we understand it, the, the funding that will be made available to hospitality is probably 100% funding. So it's not going to be uh, the case where you've got to put a match in. But there's, there, there hasn't been a great deal of information, as I've, as I've seen yet, that's come out on that. Um, but we, we, will, we will update our website once we've got it. And I think that's all of the questions that we've had. So um, a big thank you to, to all of you for watching uh, and listening. Um, and as Alison has said, if anyone's got any questions, um, please get in touch um, uh, with us and we'll be more than happy to, to come back to you as quickly as we can. But stay safe and uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Oh, Harry, there's another question that's come through. Um, yeah, the gross... I'll answer this, sorry. Hi, with the payroll grant, the gross pay has to be £1,560. Yes, it has to be £1,560 over that three-month period. So it's the gross taxable pay, just to stress that as well. Thank you. Brilliant. And I think, yeah, there was one, one final comment, but I think it was just to say thank you. So, uh, as, uh, yeah, thank you again to you all. And, uh, yeah, as I said, I hope we will see you all soon. Thank you.